Hi everyone, I'm Dulja Trikamji and uh, it's an absolute pleasure for me to be joining you today on this uh, wonderful workshop. I'm a pediatrician and an allergy specialist and I look forward to um, enlightening you all a bit more on this very hot topic internationally on food allergies. I'm sure we all know that we hear now more about food allergies than we ever did before. Um, it's almost like a buzzword everywhere we go, whether it's at restaurants, whether it's at uh, um, in, in schools, in classrooms, when our kids are doing extramural activities, it's always um, a point of conversation and something that is uh, more heard of now than it ever was before. Um, so firstly, I wanted to talk about what best we can do as mums to prevent our kids from getting food allergy. Obviously, if your child is going to be at a risk and is going to get a food allergy, you cannot stop it completely. But there are things that you can do in your life, in your lifestyle, um, that can decrease or minimize the risk of your kid having food allergy. And to understand that first, we need to understand why food allergies are increasing. One of the reasons is what we call the hygiene hypothesis. And basically what this means is that as we've become more cleaner and more sanitary, as we've become more artificial in terms of our lifestyles, we actually are developing more diseases and more immune mediated illnesses, allergies being one of them. Allergies come from your immune system. So when your immune system is weak, it would mount what we call an abnormal response to a food versus a normal response, which should be um, tolerating it. Um, so the first thing we can do is I always tell moms that it all starts from the time you're pregnant. When you're pregnant, um, back in the day, decades ago, um, there was advice that if you have a history of food allergy or you're worried about allergies, that you needed to stay away from things that were potentially allergenic. And those things would be your peanuts, your nuts, your eggs, your cow's milk. Uh, research has now shown that early exposure is actually great for babies. So from the time you find out that you are pregnant, make sure unless you have a medical contraindication that you are tolerating and you eating. Have your cow's milk, have your egg, have your peanut butter. There's no method, there's no specific uh, um, there's no specific dose that you have to have, but all you want is for your body to be exposed to this because when you're pregnant, your body is actually providing nutrients to your unborn baby and that's what helps your baby to grow. So as we know throughout pregnancy, um, in each different trimester, different parts of the body in your baby are formed. And as your baby is being formed, what we want to do is support the baby's body in the best possible way. So when we're exposing baby's body in the period of development in utero to many of these allergenic proteins, we're actually telling the body, hey guys, you need to get used to absorbing these proteins, you need to get used to tolerating these proteins, and these, these body cells would then be less likely to have a shock or abnormal response when they're born and when they're older. And then also, again, once you deliver your baby, simple things, ensuring that um, you know, we recommend generally exclusive breastfeeding. Breastfeeding is full with lots of immune properties, lots of immunoglobulins, which we cause little kind of fighter cells, which help um, immune mediated conditions and diseases. So breastfeeding is great. Um, and then something which people often don't associate with the skin um, is food allergy. So food allergy and skin um, allergies go kind of hand in hand um, and um, research is now showing that uh, children who have broken skin barriers and broken skin barriers are those kids who would have eczema and would have uh, dermatitis or atopic dermatitis on their skin are actually at a higher risk of developing allergies. Um, in fact, eczema is in our what we call a step ladder atopic march or allergic march the first way that a child would present with allergies. So the first thing you can do is ensure from day zero, you're nourishing the skin, you're nourishing the skin barrier, and you're preventing any irritation on the skin as well. And then going forward after that, 
Um, we do recommend, according to the National Department of Health guidelines, exclusive breastfeeding for six months. But I want to share some research with you. And as an allergy specialist, this is something that I recommend and many allergy specialists globally all around the country recommend. Research um, done in um, different parts of the world, but one of the big studies done in London, in United Kingdom, showed that children who were exposed to food proteins, and this study was particularly with peanuts, were actually at a lower risk of developing food allergy if they started being exposed to peanuts from four months of age. So we call this early weaning practices. Um, and kids who were kept away from these peanut allergens uh, for a longer period of time were actually more likely to have developed a peanut allergy. So what that tell, told us as allergologists and pediatric allergists was that the earlier we expose babies to food proteins that could cause potential allergies, the better it is for their immune system and their immune mechanism. So again, like I said, we don't go against the National Department of Health, Health Guidelines as a blanket approach but to my patients privately, I always tell them that research is showing that your immune system between four months and six months is going through a very massive and rapid development. And because it's developing at that time, that's the best time to get these proteins in so that while the immune system is growing, your immune system is going to adapt and learn how to tolerate these proteins. Um, another thing that you can do is ensuring that your child gets exposed to external things. External things in terms of the environment would be your dogs, your cats, your animals, your pollen, your trees. Uh, one of the problems with the hygiene hypothesis is that we are not exposing our kids to enough in the environment. Um, and that's why kids are tending to react more to things in the environment now than they ever were before. Um, obviously, there are other factors associated with this and the other factors include pollution and climate change. But certainly, if your child is going to be born in the century and be exposed to the pollution and global warming effects um, that we are all exposed to, what you want to do is you want to manage that in this time and this era. Um, and another classic way, because as specialists, we always believe in research, um, that this has been proven apart from the hygiene hypothesis that I've mentioned to you, is in various studies springing up from all parts of the world. One of them was done among the Amish community in the United States, where they found that among the Amish, so you would know that in that community, uh, religiously, they believe that they should not be um, anything unnatural in the environment. So that would include anything electronic from an electric kettle to a refrigerator, microwave. They don't watch television. They're completely disconnected from anything that's artificial. They eat their plants and their vegetables from the ground and they source everything, including their milk, directly from the cow or directly from the goat and everything is completely natural. They're walking barefoot on the sand and they're sleeping in the actual planet and the earth. Um, and among the Amish community, there's almost close to zero allergies. So even whilst the United States shows such a rapid increase in allergies, um, ahead of the rest of the world. In the USA, it's literally an epidemic at the moment. Um, the Amish within the United States, with that genetic material and with that same climate uh, environment, are showing that there's less um, allergies. And that tells us that exposure, dogs, cats, animals, plants, milk, cow's milk, straight from Mother Earth is actually good. Um, so that also speaks to our homestead. So, you know, in terms of our pets at home and in terms of the environment outside, let the kids get exposed. The next thing I wanna talk about is how do I know if my child has a true food allergy? Now, this is something that I'm extremely passionate about because this is something that I would say keeps me very much in business, but something that has a massive negative impact on you as mums and on you as the actual patient. Um, there's a lot of research now and what we look at for me as an allergist is what we call true food allergy. Now, true food allergy basically means that if your body 
is associated or exposed to something that it is allergic to, truly allergic to, immediately the protein from there, and let's use peanut as an example, when you touch a peanut, literally on your skin or you eat a peanut, your immune system in your entire body is going to be jolted into saying that, look, we've been exposed to a protein from something we're allergic to. Our job is to react and your body is going to mount a response. This response is going to occur immediately. We usually say within two to three minutes, but it can go up to 30 to 40 minutes or within the first hour. That is now a true food allergy. And the way you're going to identify this is uh, if it's in the mouth, swelling or itching inside the mouth, redness or swelling or itching around the lips, um, swelling around the eyes, extreme hives on the face, around the mouth, on the entire body. And then more significant effects would be a rise or a drop in blood pressure, which might, which might make your child feel dizzy or faint or fall down or lethargic. They could become sweaty because they're now going unconscious. And then that's the next thing. Neurologically, they're not talking normally um, and their heart rate could go up or heart rate to, could go down breathing becomes an issue. They could start wheezing um, and that's in your lower airways. You could start feeling choky because you can't breathe and that's in your upper airways. So these are all signs of a true allergic reaction. And I think it's always important for us to know that we can distinguish a true allergic reaction because especially now um, in the 21st century, we're finding that more and more people are being diagnosed with allergies or feel they might have allergies with symptoms that aren't necessarily associated with your immune system and symptoms which aren't really necessarily associated with a true immune mediated reaction. Um, and whilst, you know, lots of mums say that, you know, we'd rather be safe and avoid these foods. If we go back to the first bit that we chatted about, which was that exposure is key and exposure is good. If your child is not correctly diagnosed with a true food allergy and it's false, the diagnosis in terms of, you know, your child isn't really allergic, perhaps they've had some sort of other reaction and a doctor might have done bloods or maybe the wrong tests were done. You're going to keep your child away from this and that could be at the detriment of your child because that could be at the detriment of your child actually producing immunity and producing tolerance against this food. So it's always really, really key to ensure that if you've got a diagnosis of a food allergy, that you know that you're seeing the right doctors, that the correct diagnosis is made, the correct symptoms are looked for, so the history is extremely important. Um, and another example I'll give you is that if your child has been eating egg or eating milk or eating wheat or peanuts for years and years and years, it's very unlikely, extremely, extremely unlikely, almost impossible that suddenly they're going to start becoming allergic to it because the way the immune system works is that the immune system would already have built tolerance and would already have built antibodies against this. So really, really, again, key and really important to ensure that you're looking for the right symptoms. And when the tests are done, if your child's already eaten something before and you're being told that your child has an allergy, that you ask the questions of what does this mean? How bad is the allergy? How do I treat the allergy? Um, what do the blood tests mean? When do we assess the blood tests? And then we come to the third part of our talk is managing these food allergies and the consequences of it. So let's say now that your child has been diagnosed with a food allergy. The reason why it's so key to ensure that the allergy has been correctly diagnosed and has been um, correctly um, assessed and a proper management plan is put into place is A, if the diagnosis is correct, a food allergy can be potentially fatal. Um, fatal. We hear every day uh, in the news about a kid um, all parts of the world who has eaten something um, and there's been an accident and the child has potentially died from something um, and you don't want to be in that situation. We also hear all the time about all these reactions associated um, with accidents in restaurants, at school canteens. So these are things that affect not just the child, but it would affect everybody around them as well. Um, so, you know, EpiPens, which is the adrenaline auto-injector, which is what we use 
um, to treat a major bad allergic reaction needs to be administered to a child. You need to be trained how to use it. And in terms of mild reactions, we also have other medication which your doctor should prescribe to you for you to keep at hand. You should be prescribed with a medical alert bracelet so that in the case of an incident where you're isolated and a family member isn't there, the paramedic or a passerby is aware that this person has a true allergy. Um, then in terms of the consequences, because I'm going to go back now to the dif difference between a true food allergy and uh, perhaps a reaction which might be associated with an allergy, but might just be maybe an intolerance. It might just be um, that your child has a viral infection and they're having a mild reaction. It might just be that they're having an upset tummy or food poisoning. We very often see many of these situations and they often get misdiagnosed or confused with an actual food allergy. Uh, and coming back again to why it's so important to know for sure if this is a true food allergy is if your child um, has a true food allergy, then you're going to completely avoid something in your family. You're going to have to completely avoid something. So it's not just going to impact you. It's going to impact um, your, your spouse. It's going to impact the siblings. And then we're going to school. It's going to impact all the kids in the classroom. So in terms of uh, peanut butter, for example, if there's one kid with a peanut butter allergy, Every child can't take peanut butter sandwiches to school. Um, every time they go to a party, every time they go out to a restaurant, often peanut is a hidden ingredient in many foods, Thai food, Chinese food. Um, this is something that would cause major anxiety in anybody's life. And now if we go into the cost and the economics, I always like to use the example of cow's milk because very often people who might have mild other symptoms related to cow's milk allergy um, are now told that they're allergic to cow's milk. And what happens with a cow's milk allergy is that you're now suddenly left with needing to buy other sources or plant-based milks. Not everybody can afford to buy plant-based milks. And as moms, even if you can afford it, obviously you always want to do the best for your child. Eventually, over a period of time, it adds up. So if you're going to buy in South Africa a normal uh, milk from the normal supermarkets, you're going to pay between 15, 16, 17 rand a litre. A plant-based milk is about 55 to 65 rand a litre. So if you're going to do that every single day, this is going to add up, not to mention the nutritional deficiency that your child's going to suffer because cow's milk protein has got the vitamin D and got the vitamins and the calcium that children need for their teeth, for their bones, for their healthy immunity. Um, vitamin D is key also in the skin as well. So these are all things that they're not going to get adequate quantities of. So just ensure if there's a food allergy that you are making sure that um, your child is correctly diagnosed, the correct tests are done. And that's the last bit that I just want to talk about today is we have two types of tests for a food allergy. There are only two types of tests. There are many tests on the market which um, which analyze um, hair and analyze different parts of the skin and have analyzed urine and analyze swabs in your nose and in your mouth. Um, and scientifically, these have all been proven to not work. They're unjust, they're unethical. They do not diagnose a food allergy. Um, analysis of blood done at laboratories which are not validated by medical councils and research councils. So, you know, we've got our main commercial labs. If you are visiting a government facility, then we've got the NHLS and um, I work at the University of Cape Town. We've got our own lab where we process our bloods. Um, they are only these ways of diagnosing food allergy. And this is something that myself is one of the few allergists in the country, um, but also I join hands with allergists in the United States, in Australia, where there was an expose done on this and allergists in the United Kingdom, where, you know, we're very firm on the fact that allergy tests 
tests and allergy diagnoses can only be done by medical doctors and other tests are actually not really truly going to diagnose a food allergy. So ensure that you're going to the correct doctors, you're getting correct tests done. Um, I've already told you about the negative impacts of a false diagnosis. Um, the two ways that we test is sometimes we put a, a reagent on the skin and we do a skin prick test or we do a blood test. And the blood test tests what we call the IgE, which is your actual immunoglobulin that's responsive in terms of an allergy. Some of the unvalidated tests that are being carried out by uh, non-medical practitioners um, in South Africa and also in other parts of the world are IgG tests. IgG tests are not accurate in di diagnosing any kind of allergy. In fact, IgG just simply tells you that you have been exposed to that food. So really you're spending a lot of money on something that's not really going to impact your quality of life in any way. So I think uh, the take home messages here is food allergy is increasing. There are many various factors for this. Um, we take food allergy very seriously because it can be potentially fateful. Um, but on the, on the flip side, many patients um, over a period of time can overcome their food allergies. And many patients are diagnosed with food allergies when they aren't truly allergic. Um, and because it has such massive effects on your quality of life, uh, we're also very passionate as allergists about ensuring that while we manage proper food allergies really, really well, that when somebody's not allergic, we also ensure that they are diagnosed correctly and they're able to eat what they need to eat so that their nutrition and their quality of life is not impacted. Um, even though it's not great for my business, I always tell my patients, my best days in my practice are the days that I undiagnose food allergies. And this literally happens almost every day. My favorite is telling a six-year-old or a seven-year-old that they're not allergic to milk anymore and watch that smile when they walk out the room telling me that they can now eat ice cream and um, they can now eat cakes at birthday parties without questioning what type of milk is in there. They can eat dairy, uh, dairy filled lollies. They can eat chocolate when it's their friend's birthday in class. And um, that significantly changes a little child's life. I thank you so much for your attention. And um, I thank once again, Baby Yum Yum and Nutripeeds for giving me this wonderful opportunity to share uh, my knowledge on food allergy with you. Thank you so much.